So today's speaker is Rafal Demkovic Dobransky and uh, from the University of Warsaw. Uh, his areas of interest lie in quantum information theory with a special focus on quantum estimation and quantum metrology. And today, Rafal is giving a talk titled Multi-Parameter Quantum Metrology, Dramatis Personae, with Heisenberg, Fisher, Bayes, and Noyes. And so this, this should be a very interesting talk to start off uh, this term series, especially given the creative uh, title and abstract that we got. This was basically the beginning of a joke, and we got a bit of a spoiler, but uh, I kind of want to know the ending to this joke. So with that, uh, the virtual floor is yours and uh, take it away. Great, uh, thanks a lot. So let me let me share my screen. So you see everything, yes? Uh, yes, we can see yeah, everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know why this, this stuff is here. Okay, so... Uh, hmm. Okay, now maybe it will hide. Oh, good. So uh, I'm really happy to be here. And as, as it was introduced, please interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, I want to make it a bit more dramatic. So that's why I, I chose this form of presentation. So it will be kind of a story about these four characters, Heisenberg, Fisher, Bias, and some personification of noise, as you can see. So, uh, the story goes like this: that um, we will <laughs> we will uh, be invited to to Heisenberg for a party. So the Heisenberg um, wants to invite uh, Fisher and Bias uh, <laughs> and explain them why Heisenberg limit is called the Heisenberg limit. So great! I'm talking about the Heisenberg limit for twenty years, says Fisher, and never thought. Why? So I think it's a it's a it's an it's an important point that we are talking about Heisenberg limit a lot in quantum metrology, and sometimes people may wonder, okay, but is it really related related with Heisenberg uncertainty relation or or it's something different? So I want to show you now a simple argument that indeed it is. So imagine imagine the the simplest unitary estimation problem where you have some input state that is acted on with some unitary parameterized by phi. So phi is, you can think it's a time of evolution. So the evolution is e to i phi and some generator lambda. You can think Hamiltonian and time. And now you want to estimate phi, this parameter phi. So we can extract information on phi by measuring some observable A. So observable A is something, some observable. And uh, we, compute expectation value on this output state of this observable A, and let's call it A as a function of phi. So now we just do, you know, the school or, or, or maybe basic graduate studies formula for linear error propagation. So if you measure observable A, which depends on parameter phi, and you want to extract information on phi, the uncertainty of estimating phi by linear error propagation formula will be just uncertainty of observable A, of expectation value of observable A, divided by the absolute value of the derivative of this, this expectation value over the parameter. Now, if you take our model, you will notice that actually derivative of expectation value, if you have this state that depends on phi in this way by this unitary, it's just given by the commutator of this um, observable and this generator. You can easily uh, recall that it's exactly, if we, if phi was time, we would have exactly commutator with the Hamiltonian as an evolution of expectation value of an observable. And now we can use Heisenberg uncertainty relation, the standard one, for observable A and operator lambda. So you see this line is nothing else but just standard Heisenberg uncertainty, where in the enumerator, we will plug uh, this absolute value of this commutator. We replace it by this derivative of expectation value over parameter. And now we plug it into this linear error propagation formula, and we arrive that uncertainty of estimation, so I, I, I write it as delta phi, 
I added this tilde to indicate that it's really an estimator and not the real parameter. It's uncertainty of this estimation. It's larger than one over two and the standard uh, deviation of this uh, uh, observable lambda. Okay, so like square root of, of variance of this uh, of, of this generator lamp, this operator that generates the evolution. And now we have something which looks like uncertainty relation for estimator and generator. Okay, and uh, in particular, if this was like optical interferometry, when this generator is just number of photons, um, we we could have the variance which would be maximal n over half and then we would get uncertainty which is delta phi is larger than one over n and this is sometimes called phase photon number uncertainty relation and and uh, it's it's often uh, called like that this is a heisenberg uncertainty relation for phase and, and photon numbers for example so so this is you see the derivation where i didn't use fisher information at all but of course um Okay, and this this would be the, the optimal state, the superposition of zero and n photons, if we think about single mode evolution. And and probably you saw this kind of derivations, but using Fisher information if you are working in quantum estimation theory. So indeed, Fisher can do it more rigorously, okay, rather than using this linear error propagation trick. So we we are referring to this quantum kramer row inequality, which states that for any locally unbiased estimator, there is a lower bound on the on the uncertainty of this estimation, which is one over square root of quantum Fisher information of the state, which depends on the parameter. And for pure state, this formula for quantum Fisher is very easy. It's four times this expression where psi dot is just the derivative of our pure state. And then if you take our model, you see that computing this quantum Fisher information just amounts to uh, getting this four times variance of this generator lambda. You plug it into quantum memory, quantum Kramer inequality, and you get the same inequality as we obtained from this linear error propagation tricks. So you see that somehow using Kramer Rao inequality, you are doing it more rigorously, but the same point as you would do with this linear error propagation trick and using explicitly Heisenberg uncertainty relation. Okay, so so that's why the Heisenberg limit, which is which is which is this one usually this one over n, would be referred to as Heisenberg limit as the uh, scaling of estimating phase when you take the optimal state with n photons. Uh, then uh, then. It is really related with Heisenberg uncertainty relation. Okay, so in case of interferometry, uh, to be more precise, we usually think about interferometer which has two arms, not a single arm. So then we are thinking more in these terms that we have two modes and some number of photons in one and second mode. So this would be a general superposition of such states. And we imprint phase, for example, on one arm. So our generator of evolution is number of photons in arm one times identity. And indeed, in this case, it's easy to see that the optimal state is the so-called noon state. So the superposition of n photons going upper arm and n photons going lower arm. And we have this famous Heisenberg limit formula that you cannot estimate phase better than one over n. OK, so Fisher thinks it's his limit not Heisenberg. Okay, so now some people might not be satisfied because Fisher would tell you that then it's simple. You use noon state and you get this Heisenberg limit. So basically intuitively it's just because your face is being imprinted n times faster than for single photo. But now bias asks, can we really reach this limit when n goes to infinity? So is this one over n limit saturable? And now it's not an obvious question, because if you think really what happens with this kind of state, you see that if you shift phase by 2 pi over n, this output state doesn't change. It's the same. So it means there is no way you can discriminate between phase changes, which are 2 pi over n. So what does it mean? 
it means that to do something meaningful, you already need to know at which like interferometric fringe you are. So in which sector of this width, let's say two pi over n or pi over n you are. But that means you already need to know phase with something like Heisenberg limit, something of the order of one over n. So you need to be, you need to know the phase with precision, more or less Heisenberg, with Heisenberg limit to reach Heisenberg limit. Okay. So this really doesn't make sense okay, if you look at it in this way. Sorry, I have a question on the previous slide, I think. Sure. So this, uh, this one. Or... Yeah. So the question is, is there a difference between these two derivations in terms of the at the asymptotic and the non-asymptotic regimes of number of measurements. Okay, so so I would say that first of all, uh, quantum Kramer inequality is a rigorous bound that we know if we use locally unbiased estimators, we can never break. Okay, and additionally, we know that. Uh, that formally this limit, if you repeat experiment many times, we can saturate by some particular strategy, for example, involving uh, maximum likelihood estimation and so on. So, so this is, I would say, like strong basis for theoretical basis here. With linear error propagation, so I mean, formula here is the same. So you would, could argue that, okay, it's equivalent. But of course, this linear error propagation formula and this derivation is kind of heuristic a little bit. Yes, there is no guarantee that you really have like fundamental bound because you use linear error propagation formula, which is which only works assuming like well proper behavior of of the objects you are dealing with that they don't change too much on on, on some on some scale. Uh, so. So I would say that uh, from this proper quantum Kramer inequality, we know that these results are rigorous. And additionally, we have some understanding of, of asymptotics. While with linear error propagation, we don't even have understanding. I mean, we cannot be sure rigorously either in asymptotic or non-asymptotic. Sometimes they will be equivalent to this Fisher approach, but I wouldn't give my head that it's always like this. All right, thank you. Okay, good. So uh, we are at this old fart uh, thing. So how how then um, uh, it should be done? So first of all, let us let us still follow the Fisher like way of thinking. So actually, if you think that you can use your unitary channel n times, okay? So this is like now moving more from this optical scheme to like more quantum information scheme. So you imagine you are given this unitary channel U phi as a black box. So you can send some state, for example, single photon into it and, and do something, and then you are allowed to use it n times. But additionally, you are allowed to use arbitrary ancillary systems and arbitrary controls. This would be, what we call the most general adaptive quantum metrological scheme, if you are just limited by the fact that you can use your channel n times, okay? So this is somehow very fundamental. And you can you can consider this general unitary estimation where you estimate phi phi, and there is the generator which has a spectrum which goes from lambda minus to lambda plus. And, and in this paper, 2006, they derived that actually for this kind of model, the bound is the following, and actually it's the same bound you would get just for a simple parallel scheme where you have your unitaries in parallel and send entangled state. So actually, uh, from the point of view of Fisher information, there is no uh, gain in adaptiveness in this unitary estimation problems. Okay, it's the same bound. And this is this Heisenberg limit for general uh, generator. Okay, so the dif difference is just that you have this difference of extremal eigenvalues of the generator and you have this Heisenberg limit. But the question remains, 
is it really a saturable uh, bound? So I have, I, 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 yes? sorry for the interruption. I have another question for you. Sure. So is there a gain in terms of not having two pi over n, uh, not having a two pi over n problem? Here? In this adaptive, you mean? I think so. This is this is the only question. This is an anonymous question. Yeah. So if the person yeah, okay. okay, so of course, of course, in principle, this adaptive scheme allows you to do probably more, but also parallel scheme. Also, okay, I mean, this two pi over n was just a problem with this particular noon states. Okay. So if you in the parallel scheme, also if you used some other states, you you could avoid maybe this problem, but then you are not. Uh, sure whether you can reach this limit because this limit was computed for this null state and for other states probably this limit would be different okay so here in this adaptive scheme you could also have the same problem this ambiguity if you used a protocol which really tells you that fisher will be exactly this okay fisher information so so then you would have a, a similar problem uh, but if you use some other states or other protocols, you may not have this problem, but, that, but then it's not clear what you can really achieve. Okay, so so now I will move to to this to this question. So uh, you remember I mentioned that quantum Fisher information gives you the bound, and it is saturable in the limit of many repetitions. In the sense that if you have some limit one over n, but you repeat experiment k times the limit that you can saturate is one over square root of k and one over n so so actually you repeat k times and you get this one over square root of k and when k goes to infinity you are sure you can saturate this limit but notice that here i use this entangled n photons in like separate chunks so that's why i call it like poor man's heisenberg limit because it's not really a Heisenberg limit in terms of total number of photons you used, okay? Because total number of photons would be K times N. So the, this proper Heisenberg limit, if you want really to use your all resources optimally, would be one over K N, not one over square root K times N, okay? So, so this is my question. Can you reach this proper Heisenberg limit where you use all your resources optimal okay and not say okay i use them and then i repeat but i don't care how many times i will repeat okay blah 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 okay and this is what i would call the true heisenberg limit so the true truly saturable heisenberg limit the one that you can saturate and there is a protocol with this number of photons that gives you this precision and to address this, it's much better, or even I would say it's the only possible way to follow a different approach, Bayesian approach, or you could follow something which is called min-max approach, which is very closely related to Bayesian approach. So what is Bayesian approach? The Bayesian approach has the same uh, scheme of state, channel estimation, so on. But additionally, we say that there is some prior distribution of our parameter that we estimate, so our prior knowledge. Okay, and the Bayesian cost is actually the cost which you would compute normally in Fisher approach in the similar way that you take the deviation of our estimator from the two true value squared, so like our variance, and you sum it with probabilities of getting different outcomes. But in Bayesian approach, you additionally average it with this prior distribution over the true value of parameter phi. Okay, and this is what we call Bayesian variance or Bayesian cost. And in Bayesian procedure, this should be minimized. Okay, over measurement and and estimators. And uh, and actually, in full generality, so so following this adaptive, the most general adaptive scheme and this most general generator, we manage in this paper to to give the rigorous derivation how low can be this cost be and the interesting thing is that you know 
critics of Bayesian approach would always say, oh, it's Bayesian approach. You don't know what prior to choose. It depends on the prior. So it's very artificial because how, how do we know this prior is better than the other? But the nice thing here is that in the limit of large number of channels, prior becomes irrelevant because data dominates the problem. And we proved that for any prior regular enough, we get the following limit, following a bound in the limit of n going to infinity. And it looks almost identically to this uh, Fisher information bound, but it has this additional factor pi. And actually, this is true, uh, truly saturable bound for estimating phase if you have n photons and n goes to infinity, and you can saturate this bound. Okay? The bound you get from Fisher, from this point of view, of using all resources in, uh, optimally is not such a quick question. Where does this pi come from? <laughs> okay, so uh, it doesn't come from the prior. This I can say. Okay, it comes as a result of the derivation where actually the structure of optimal states uh, are very different from the noon states. Okay, they are. Like noon states are the states that have only this extremal uh, superposition of these extremal photon numbers. Here in this Bayesian approach, you will see that actually optimal state is much has much smoother distribution of coefficients. Like the amplitudes are distributed like a sine function, and actually from this sine function, this pi comes in the end. And it's not the prior because the prior doesn't matter at all. Whatever prior you choose, in the limit you get the same cost. So it's not that we estimate from zero to two pi, yes? This is not this pi, I would say, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, but I don't give you the details because uh, this 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 will be too much, okay? It's 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 in this paper if you are interested, but, but mathematically it comes from the structure of this optimal state, which is very different from this noon state. And it doesn't have this phase ambiguity, that's the point. Okay, so uh, in case of this interferometric example, we would have not one over n, but pi over n, okay? Th this would be this uh, asymptotically saturable Heisenberg limit. Okay, so this was without noise. So now comes the noise, okay? And it changes a lot. So Heisenberg wants to hide somewhere. So adding noise, uh, for me, means that I replace unitary evolutions by like quantum channels, so completely positive maps that depend on the parameter phi. So you can think that Krauss operators that describe quantum channel depend on parameter phi. Okay, so in so in physical terms, you replace, for example, interferometer with lossy interferometer, where you introduce some uh, virtual beam splitters that scatter photons, or you instead of rotating your qubit, you add, for example, the phasing of the qubit that shrinks the block ball to some ellipsoid, okay? In the models I will mention, I will somehow only focus on this kind of models where parameter is encoded unitarily and actually the noise is some unwanted feature additionally added on top of it that doesn't depend on the parameter. I will focus on this models, but the tools I will mention, they work in general for any kind of uh, dependence on the parameter. But this kind of models are the most interesting because in absence of noise, you can have Heisenberg scaling. And if you add noise, you may usually lose this Heisenberg scaling. So that's like the most dramatic uh, models where you have this most dramatic difference between noiseless and noisy. If you already have noise and you estimate parameter of noise, you will not have any such a dramatic transition. Okay, and now this is a very long story which I put only in one slide because again, uh, this is maybe not the main topic of this talk. I mean, this talk is kind of general. I want to give you this general overview. So this is a story which started in 2008 and basically finished this year or last year of understanding what you can do in presence of noisy channels that you want to estimate if you are given n channels 
and you can perform this arbitrary adaptive strategies. So arbitrary number of ancillas, arbitrary entangled state, arbitrary control, arbitrary collective measurement. And you have some channel with parameter to estimate. And the question is, if this is noisy, can you still protect, for example, Heisenberg scaling in presence of noise or you cannot? Okay. And the trick, the mathematical trick that allowed to really solve this problem completely. So I, I just said that this problem is solved completely provided noise is uncorrelated. So it means I have these channels acting at each stage, like independently of each other. Okay. And the mathematical trick that worked here very well was trick which was based on writing your channel and looking at its different Krauss representations. So, you know, quantum CP map can have different equivalent Krauss representations. And actually this was the mathematical trick already uh, uh, proposed by Fujiwara in 2008 to look at these different Krauss representations and in this way obtain bounds on Fisher that you can get from the output state of, of a quantum channel. And the formula for the, the bound now for, 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 the, for the variance of estimation looks like this. So, so basically what you have in this parenthesis is the upper bound on quantum Fisher information. And it looks maybe a bit scary, but it's not really very scary because you have N, which is the number of times you use the channel. And then you only have two operators, alpha and beta, and these norms are operator norms. And this alpha and beta are just operators that you construct from Krauss operators of single channel. So they are just single channel operators. So for example, if, if this is a qubit channel, even if you use a lot of them, this bound is expressed in terms of operators, just qubit operators. Okay? So mathematically, it's very uh, simple to deal with this bound. And there is this minimization over different Krauss representations that apparently can be also very easily numerically performed via semi-definite program. So again, I don't mention technical details and how this is derived because it's a long story. As you can see, it took a lot of many years to arrive at this simple formula, but I want to convey this information that it's extremely powerful bound. First of all, why the first thing you see, it has two terms. One, where this Fisher information scales linearly with N, and the other part, which scales quadratically with n. So we see this is the bound on the inverse of, of the variance. So the Heisenberg scaling means we would have one over n squared. So if you are able to find Krauss representation for which this operator beta is zero, it means the second term vanishes and you get a bound where variance scales like one over n, which means uncertainty scales like one over square root of n. And this means Heisenberg scaling is impossible to achieve with arbitrary tricks. Like you see, this kind of schemes, they take into account arbitrary quantum error correction tricks, anything you can imagine that's allowed by quantum mechanics. Okay. So basically, this condition for beta being equal to zero has a very simple algebraic uh, equivalent uh, condition that your Hamiltonian of evolution, which here is written as uh, Krauss dot Krauss of, of Krauss's written in particular representation, it would be exactly Hamiltonian if we had this unitary evolution and Krauss operators and only this unitary would be generated by this Hamiltonian age. Here it's written in full generality where these Krauss operators can have arbitrary dependence on parameters. The algebraic condition is to check if this sum of this Krauss dot Krauss belong to the space spanned by product of Krauss operators. If this is so, you can find Krauss representation for which beta B will be zero. And then this quadratic part disappears from the bound and you cannot reach Heisenberg scale. And the, the, uh, the pessimistic message is that this is true for typical noisy channels. So for channels which you would take by random, like full rank channels, for example, that have generic noise. You don't really you know, play very carefully to select this kind of noise or other. 
for generic noisy channels. This is true. A quick uh, question on you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what does this model correspond to in an experimental setting when there's a real setup to consider for for this state? Uh, what What do we mean? Uh, so, so uh, in what experimental setup uh, you think of? Right. Well, so this person can specify more, but I guess just. If I can, it's any. I mean, any any situation when you have, for example, n particles, okay, or for example, n photons that go through interferometer and have losses. This you can model like this. Any model where you you can uh, you can use n particles, entangle them, uh, act collectively on them, but noise acts in uncorrelated way on them. Okay, so I would say this is. All the models where where uh, action of the channel actions this n actions of the channels are not correlated with each other, so noise is not correlated. All right, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so then the question is okay. So if this if this Hamiltonian is in this span. You can by no means recover Heisenberg scaling in terms of number of users of the channel. Uh, so the question is, if this Hamiltonian is not in this span, can you recover? And this this is the idea that if this Hamiltonian, so this generator effectively of this parameter encoding, is not in this span, it means there is some potentially signal that can be preserved while you correct all the noise with some error correcting procedures. Because what is the problem? In principle, you can always do quantum error correction. But if you correct noise, and by doing so, if you also correct the signal, that's the problem. Okay, that, that's the problem. You should correct noise, but leave some signal uh, non-trivial. And this is the point of this condition, this algebraic condition. And indeed, it was proven by C.C. Zhu and... Uh, and uh, Sang, Presky, and Yang in 2018, and then it was generalized in 2021, that and indeed it is if and only if condition. So if this Hamiltonian belongs to this span, you cannot have Heisenberg scaling. If it doesn't belong, you can explicitly provide quantum error correcting protocols that allow you to recover Heisenberg scaling. So for example, let me, let me give you a very simple example. Like qubit rotation, you rotate, you estimate the angle and the dephasing, the standard dephasing along the z-axis. Okay, so so the z-axis remains untouched. The, the the dephasing is in this x-y plane. So we can check for this model, this uh, this condition. So in this case, Hamiltonian. So this thing that generates the parameter rotation is just sigma z, okay, because it's rotation around z-axis. For dephasing, you have two Krauss operators, proportional to identity and proportional to sigma z. And now if you ask yourself, does Hamiltonian belong to the space spanned by products of Krauss? Of course it does, because you have Krausses which are identity and sigma z, so product of them is sigma z, so and Hamiltonian is sigma z, so it does. And this means there is no place to recover Heisenberg scale. So if you have n atoms that are subject to independent dephasing there is no way to entangle them to do error correction to do so thing and recover for example heisenberg sensing of i don't know magnetic field in presence of dephasing but if you change the model to the model where rotation is still around z but dephasing is in other direction so you see, in this case, the, the Krauss's will be identity and sigma x. And now Hamiltonian doesn't belong to this space. And actually, in this case, you can recover Heisenberg scale. And you can propose a very simple two qubit protocol that you repeat and you remove noise while keep this unitary encoding uh, going coherently over end users of the channel. Quick uh, interruption. So when the Hamiltonian is bad in this sense, can you still get a better uh, constant prefactor on the standard quantum? Uh, yes, 
Yes, that's a great question. Uh, yes, okay, so of course, the, the question is not about only Heisenberg versus non Heisenberg. So let me give you this generic behavior. So Heisenberg does not tolerate generic noise, but indeed, as somebody says, we can still have some gains in terms of constant coefficient. So I would plot like a generic situation like this. If you look how uncertainty of estimating some unitary parameter scales in presence of noise, scales with the number of uses of this channel, then this look at this black line. So at first, for small numbers, you will probably go along this Heisenberg line, so one over n line, because you will still be able to entangle, place something, and the noise maybe is not so strong to kill you. But then if you inc increase this number of uses, you see that at some point you have to be really caref careful because noise is more destructive. And at some point, this achievable precision will flatten to one over square root of n, and it will never cross this analytical bound which we get from these formulas that I showed you. But indeed, if you compare, for example, with a protocol where you don't use entanglement at all, so you just use products of n, n, n states and send them independently to the channels, you would be uh, you would get worse scale. Okay, and this actually this difference, so this is like log log scale here. Yes, so so the scalings uh, are the same, but but then uh, this this difference is this coefficient actually. Yes. So, uh, so indeed, you can try to get better coefficient, and this would be your quantum enhancement. And additionally, the message from here is that since the enhancement is in terms of constant factor, uh, it's usually enough to entangle just a little bit, not too much, and you can already reach this optimal performance. Okay, so in, in particular, you could entangle just some ch small chunks of atoms or photons, and and you would basically reach almost optimal performance. Okay, in the asymptotic limit. And this this is a nice case because now bias is happy because if you really can think that you can entangle things in chunks and repeat, then you have many repetition scenario instead of a single shot scenario effectively. And then one can prove that what Fisher information predicts and what Bayesian approach predicts will be equivalent. Okay, and that's nice. So if you don't have Heisenberg scaling, you can expect all the approaches, Fisher approach and Bayes approach to give asymptotically equivalent results. So just to give you the, the most important example, so lossy optical interferometry, okay? In this case, unfortunately, this beta can be found zero, and that's why you don't have Heisenberg scaling. But indeed, you can find this optimal coefficient. And this bound, if you perform this minimization, looks like this, one minus eta over eta times n, where eta is the overall transmission of the interferometer. So one minus eta are, are losses, basically. And, and if you compare it with what you would get if you just send n photons independently, one after each other, or you would send coherent light, you would simply not have this enumerator. You would have one in the enumerator. So this one minus eta for lossy optical interferometry is actually a fundamental quantum enhancement factor that you can get. You cannot do, get bet, anything better. And what is, so this is maybe bad, but the nice thing is it's actually, this is almost exactly the enhancement people now obtain experimentally in gravitational wave detectors, thanks to using squeezed uh, states of light. Because actually you can show that using coherent and squeezed states of light is basically optimal strategy because it saturates asymptotically this bound. Even if you don't squeeze too much, you just need to squeeze a little bit and you asymptotically can saturate this bound arbitrary close. And present day LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave detectors, they use squeeze light that allows them reduction of noise by let's say 30%. So this one minus, uh, so, 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 and, and, and actually ETA in their setups is around 60, 70%. So it's exactly 
this one minus eta is exactly the more or less reduction in terms of noise that they see thanks to use squeeze line. So, so in this sense, I could tell that you don't have to play with more fancy states of light to, to get better because you will not be able to get better in presence of this level of loss that they have in their system. Yes. So um, there are no questions at this point. No, no questions for now. Good. Okay. So, um, so by the way, my talk is called multi-parameter estimation. I still didn't get there, <laughs> but okay. I hope I will get there. Uh, but I wanted here to mention our latest paper, which is still in single parameter um, framework because this paper was motivated by this general question, is there fundamentally asymptotic gain in using adaptive schemes versus parallel schemes? Okay, so, so this is how I schematically describe them. So parallel is just you send entangled, all entangled states simultaneously through parallel end channels and adaptive is the one I described. So actually you can derive a slightly tighter bound compared to what I gave you for parallel channels. And this bound actually was shown to be saturable in this paper from 2021 by Sisi Zhu and Yang Yang. Uh, they gave explicit protocol that saturate this bound whenever you can reach Heisenberg or you cannot reach Heisenberg, that uh, you can saturate this bound. I mean, in the sense you can find protocol that gives exactly this Fisher information that this bound predicts. While for this adaptive, this bound that I uh, I showed you before is slightly different. It differs by this term uh, with this quadratic part. And you see it's larger because it's instead of beta squared, you have beta squared and plus something. And actually this was the best bound known so far. I mean, until our last paper, where we actually managed to tighten this bound. And by tightening this, in particular, we were able to show a bound which is asymptotically equivalent to this parallel bound. So this beta squared is basically there. There is some log n over n correction which goes to zero when n goes to infinity. So the message is that when you look at Fisher information and you compare adaptive versus parallel bounds, asymptotically, there is no gain from adaptiveness for all models with uncorrelated noise, whether they use high, they can have Heisenberg or cannot have Heisenberg, for all such models, these bounds will be asymptotic equivalent. So adaptiveness can only help you when you look at some finite number of uses regime. Some also additional remark, actually in this paper, we also managed to take into account this science fiction schemes where you have something which people call causal superposition strategies where you interrogate your channels in different causal orders. So first this channel and then this in superposition of doing it another way around. Okay, but this is just a, a side remark for people who may be interested in, in, in such crazy stuff. So, okay, so this is just a thing I wanted to mention because this is our latest paper, which which I'm very proud of, and it was done with my PhD students, uh, Stasia Kurjawek, Wojtek Gurecki, and my former postdoc, Francesco Albarelli. Okay, so at this point, I will finish single parameter talk, and I would move to multi parameter issues. So, if there are any questions to the single parameter stuff, maybe, maybe it's a good time to ask. And I will try to do this multi-parameter part in 10 minutes, which, okay, it's impossible, but I will try. I see no questions for now. So, oh, wait, there's one question that came in. So is the causal orders related to quantum switch? Yeah, exactly. Sorry, 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 I didn't mention. It's exactly a special case of this is quantum switch, yes. Great, thank you. By the way, I, I saw in the schedule. I saw in the schedule that next week Andreas Winter will have a talk on 
on uh, gains from adaptive strategies versus non-adaptive in quantum discrimination. So actually, it's a very interesting topic because because you see, in in estimation, we have proven that there is no asymptotic gain, while in state in channel discrimination, there apparently is. So so channel estimation problems and discriminations are also very different from this point of view. So I think it's a okay in, in interesting maybe topic to think of in context of next week's seminar as well. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me, Rafael. Yes, I can, yes. So maybe I'd ask a question, like, could you give us your view on why sometimes we get different results in quantum phase estimation as compared to quantum channel discrimination? Like, what do you think is the big difference? So, okay, so so I think it's it's the, this issue of continuity mainly. Yes, that 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 in estimation we have this continuous parameter and 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 basically we are looking at infinitesimally um, close change small changes, while in this discrimination you have this this finite difference and that's why estimation theory is more elegant and it's easier to deal with and I think it's that's why it's easier to obtain stronger results because of this continuous structure of these problems, while in this discrimination. Okay, unless you have some very nice symmetry between these channels and so on, I think that's why it's more difficult. It's less elegant. There is no structure. Like, I don't know. That, that that's my intuition. But I would like to understand more. Yes, uh, about these relations. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to multi-parameter house. So Heisenberg is is inviting us to out after party with multi-parameters. So basic scheme for multi-parameter is very similar. We just replace one parameter with a collection of parameters. And first, let's do Fisher approach very quickly. OK, so first approach would be just we replace Fisher information with so-called Fisher quantum Fisher information matrix. And we have generalization of quantum Kramer out bound that where covariance matrix of estimation of estimators is lower bounded by inverse of quantum Fisher information matrix which can be computed, okay, explicit, explicitly with so-called symmetric logarithmic derivatives. Okay, if somebody knows this, then you know this. If you don't know this, you will not understand this. But there is a generalization, natural generalization to multi-parameters. But this generalization is far from satisfactory because quantum feature information matrix simply doesn't understand that sometimes measurements may be incompatible. So that measurements that extract information optimally about one parameter are incompatible. They're not commuting with measurements that extract optimally information on other parameters. Okay. So then Fisher needs some help and help came from Holevo. <laughs> so <laughs> this is very ahistoric story. Okay. So there is no real, it's, it's not a real story. So, <laughs> so actually Holevo in, in, in seventies, uh, developed a stronger bound than, than the quantum Kramer Rao bound. So if you write a scalar uh, version of multi-parameter quantum Kramer Rao bound, which basically means you trace covariance matrix and inverse of quantum Fisher matrix with some positive cost matrix, which simply gives weights to different parameters, which variances you will sum with what weights and so on. This is a scalar version of quantum Kramer Rao bound. And believe me or not, you can equivalently write it as some kind of minimization over some Hermitian operators Xi. Uh, I will not explain it here. This is equivalent variant of quantum Kramer Rao bound. And actually what Holevo did in 70s, and if it's in his book from, eight, from 1980s, he was able to tighten this bound by adding additional terms. Okay, to this bound. And actually, this term is responsible. I mean, it's non zero where you have indeed this measurement incompatibility issue. And this bound is referred as Holevo Kramer Rao bound. And uh, it is very nasty in terms of how it's written mathematically. And if you read the book by Holevo, I think you will be very lost unless you are really a mathematician and you are very, uh, you know, fluent in, in C star algebras and, and all the stars and all, all, all the stuff. 
And I would say that from Holevo book, you really don't understand really whether this quantity can be computed efficiently in general. And it's a funny story because it is an inequality that was known for a long time, but it was almost never used in practical uh, quantum estimation studies and quantum metrology because it was mo mostly people who were interested in it was mo were mostly like mathematically, I would say, oriented. So Holevo himself and also Japanese, some Japanese guys like Hayashi, um, they, they, they were really more interested in mathematical things. And so actually, quite recently, I would say there was a, a, a kind of twist to this story that uh, I would say with huge contribution from, from, from my former postdoc, Francesco Alborelli, who I um, pictured here. Uh, now we understand how to compute this Holevo Kramer album as a semi definite program. So that's very efficient. But also, there is some, I would say, uh, uh, not so uh, super news that actually Holevo Kramer album can be at most twice as tight compared to standard Fisher, quantum Fisher information based bound. Okay. And this was also proved by Carolo in, in, independently and by Francesco. Uh, so this is a nice bound, better than quantum Fisher bound, but at most two times tighter. But what is nice, that it is tight for pure state models and also asymptotically when you have models with multiple copies. Okay, so multiple kind of repetition scenarios. So, so that's very nice. Um, so so in Fisher approach, we would say, okay, so we can use Holevo bound and everything is great, but the bias would argue that no, it's similar problems if we really have this Heisenberg-like scaling possibility and we need to, come. I mean, take all resources in a single shot and you, we are not able to repeat experiment, we cannot use these arguments for saturability, okay? And okay, I, I need to be finishing. So I will just give you one example of contradiction in multiple phase estimation. So this is, I would say, the the, uh, the paradigmatic multi-parameter estimation model where you have P phases, P plus one arm interferometer, and you have N photons to, to use. And you want to minimize some of variances of estimating all these phases simultaneously, okay? So first of all, you can conceive the simplest strategy where you estimate each phase separately. So you divide your N photons to N over P photons and perform optimal estimation. Like you have many repetitions of different interferometers where you estimate different phases. So what would be the bound? So of course, you can use the formula for true Heisenberg limit, like Bayesian one. So pi over number of photons, yes? So in this case, it's pi over n over p photons because this is what you use in a single shot. But then you are summing variances from all estimations for all parameters. So that's, and you take square root. So that's why you have additional square root of p factor. So from this strategy, you see that the optimal scaling for this separate strategy will be pi and p to three half. So with number of parameters, it scales like p to three half. And now the question is, if you used all photons simultaneously and not split them like to this n over p chunks, can you get better scaling with number of parameters you want to estimate? And actually, this is what we were able to do in Bayesian approach with, with my, my PhD student, Wojtek Gurecki. And we proved that it's not possible, that you, again, only can have some constant factor improvement but the scaling will be the same if you perform optimal joint estimation of all phases with optimal entangled state. And then it's interesting because it's somehow contradicting a paper which uses quantum Fisher information as a figure of merit. In this paper, they consider the same model and they realized that if you consider such an entangled state, so it's like, you know, a kind of generalization of noon state, N000, and then you have N photons in different arms, which is superposed together with some coefficients alpha and beta. 
they showed that if you look at quantum Fisher information, you can prove that you can get P over 2N. Okay, so, so in the sense of quantum Cramerau bound. So it would suggest that you can have better scaling with P than if you do the separate strategy where you estimate each parameter independently. So actually this contradiction is, I would say, in favor of Bayesian approach. Actually this limit, I would argue, cannot be achieved because it uses quantum Fisher information, which can only be argued to be saturable in the limit of asymptotic number of repetitions. So actually you, you would need to include this fact that you have more and more repetitions. And actually in this problem, it would not be enough to have finite number of repetitions, but actually this number of repetitions would need to increase when you increase number of parameters to saturate the bound. And that's the reason for contradiction between these two approaches. Okay, so now I need to skip this part where I discuss multi-parameter with noise. Okay, we also have some results on it, but I skip it because it's not so crucial. And uh, I would just move to conclusion. Okay, maybe ju just, just this thing. In multi-parameter problems, in general, you have different sources of incompatibility. Input probes incompatibility that different optimal states are optimal for different parameters. You have this measurement incompatibility, so different measurements are optimal for different parameters, and then your estimators might be correlated. So what I want to tell you now is that from my point of view, the most important is this input probe incompatibility. Because actually this measurement incompatibility usually just amounts to some factor of two, which is basically this difference between Holevo and Fisher information. Okay, bound. While this correlated estimator problem is more technical problem that you may want to choose different parameterization of your parameters. It's actually this input probe incompatibility or the fact that different protocols are optimal for different parameters that usually can cause significant changes in multi-parameter problems compared to single. Okay, good. I arrived at the summary. So I just want you to think about this general adaptive model with noise. And then the summary, the message is like this. If you want to understand, can you reach Heisenberg or you cannot reach Heisenberg? In multi-parameter estimation problems, because this summary is for multi-parameter. So basically you should write these Hamiltonians for each parameter and see if perpendicular part of them to the space spanned by products of Krauss is linearly independent this would mean you can really reach Heisenberg limit for all parameters if you want to estimate them all together. Okay, and then Heisenberg scaling is possible, but to obtain the true Heisenberg limit, so the proper asymptotic formula, you should use Bayesian approach and not Fisher. So Fisher can give you information whether this Heisenberg limit is achievable at all, but to get a proper constant in this limit, you need to do some other approach. Fisher would not be enough. While if you have noise so that this Hamiltonian uh, uh, belongs to this span, so you cannot remove noise, you cannot protect Heisenberg scaling against noise, then it's bad because you don't have Heisenberg scaling. But good thing is you have constant coefficient gain from using quantum stuff, entanglements, adaptiveness, and so on. And also the nice thing is that Fisher and Bayesian approaches are equivalent. Okay, they give the same, the same asymptotics. And the last message is this, our last paper that this adapt, this asymptotic, uh, adaptiveness and asymptotic limits probably is not really beneficial uh, when you compare it with parallel schemes. And uh, I cannot uh, restrain myself from from showing this last slide and remembering that we are all fighting the war. So thank you and uh, Slava Ukraine. All right, thank you for this talk. Um, I think if anybody has any last <laughs> questions, uh, go for it. Oh, I have I'm kind of a, a very general sort of question. So, when you have one of these circuits, like the one you have here, 
basically you're you're dealing with a unitary evolution and so phases tend to appear as e to the i phi and then so this is not the, the, this there is unitary evolution plus noise so this epsilon t, this e theta is the general quantum channel where there is the unitary with parameter but additionally you have noise all well, right okay anyway but so that, that's why it's non-trivial then let, let me complete my point. Um, yes. So it's not necessarily related to this particular specific circuit. But then when you, what a Krauss operator will do is, is create trig functions of your parameter. And what that then means in general, perhaps not for this circuit, but in general, you, you find that your, your parameter is not point identified. So there could be several values. So if you think of a cosine function, and you know the value of the cosine, there might be two values that yes. you, you could have. Or if it's a cos n theta, you might have n different sure. values that it could be. So it, have you had any kind of general thoughts about this whole kind of formalism and how yes. uh, point so, identification yeah. may come into it? Yeah. So, okay. So first of all, this ambiguity you mentioned is not really fundamental. You can really go around it. And for example, Bayesian approach, by by construction avoids it because it constructs a state that gives you the uh, minimal Bayesian cost averaged over the prior. So you don't need to know anything about the phase and you can discriminate which exactly phase it was, okay, within the period. Uh, and this is done in a way that you can intuitively think like this. That for example, okay, it's not done like this exactly, but you could model it like this. That for example, you use first one or two photons to roughly estimate at which uh, place you are. Then you add some additional shift of phase. So you shift your cosine, for example, to be sine um. or something to this to you know to discriminate these two positions that were equivalent before. They are no longer equivalent after this constant shift. But this constant shift is implemented by you, so you can then counter shift it in your head when you estimate. Yes. And, and similar procedures can allow you to, you know, disambiguify everything. And actually this scheme that is here with this adaptiveness allows to incorporate this automatically. So for example, you can send some state into few first channels and then relegate what you get at the output to the measurement stage and then use next channels with different input states that you prepare from scratch or that you reuse from the others. and by shifting and adding additional phase shifts, modifying the states, you can do everything. All right, very interesting. Yes, no, that makes complete sense to me. Yeah. All right. All right. I've got two more questions here for you. So the first question is: Do these results you've shown relate in any way to whether or not you can exactly saturate the quantum kramer rao bound, or if you can only get within a factor of two to it? So, but the question is regarding multi-parameter or single parameter. So I would say in single parameter, I would argue that this pi that I showed you indicates that operationally, this kramer rao bound, when you have Heisenberg scaling, it's not operationally saturable. I mean, okay, in principle, it's saturable formally, if you are exactly at the point you are you want to estimate, <laughs> if you are exactly at the phase you want to estimate, then you can argue, yes, I can saturate kramer rao bound, even this Heisenberg limit. But if you say that you don't know the phase with some finite width, okay, even very small, epsilon finite width, and you go to the limit of n large, operationally, you will not be able to construct a protocol that gives you one over n. You would only be able to get pi over n. So, so that's why I would say it's not saturable in this sense. In the multi-parameter case, it's even worse because quantum Fisher information, even in repeated number of uses, I mean, repeated scenario is not saturable because it's this Holevo version, which is saturable. Holevo Kramer about this, this title bound. Okay, so, so this is even additional uh, level of untightness. But this Holevo Kramer bound will be saturable if you can argue that you have repeat you can repeat experiment many times, then it will be saturable. But again, if you use resources in a single shot, it will require again using this Bayesian approach. 
All right. Thank you for that. And so another question is, what happens in continuous variable estimation? For example, when there's no cap on the min or max eigenvalues of the generator, like momentum yes. position. Yes, of course. So so then you need to, I mean, if you want to follow this, this framework, you need to introduce some constraints. So for example, impose constraint on mean energy of your state. Okay. And then instead of, uh, of taking operator norm, you would take like, you know, equivalent in within, I mean, operator norm in a sense, but, but restricted to only the states that satisfy this constraint. Okay, so that these are the states that have this mean energy fixed, which which makes uh, also numerical implementation of this much more tricky, because if we have this, you know, qubit models and so on, all these operators are very small dimensional, and you can run this semi-definite program very well. If you have continuous variables and you have big dimensions, you may not always be able to numerically really get this optimal bound, like fun, like to to perform this optimal minimization over this Krauss representations, for example, that I mentioned. But you can have a good educated guesses to get a valid bound. You are not sure that this is the best bound, but it may be good enough. Okay. All right, thank you. And I, we have one last question, which I think is a nice uh, sort of much more general question here. So what do you think might be the first useful task for quantum metrology in everyday or industrial technology or science? Yes, yeah, so, okay, so so I mentioned these gravitational wave detectors, but I understand this is not a question about this. So, I mean, it's, it's also nice that there is some application which is not every day, but it's a real improvement, okay? I mean, it's not like quantum computers that didn't provide us any real improvement in any like meaningful computational task, even not everyday life. I mean, like for scientists, this is important for scientists, okay? And gravitational wave detectors really are important for scientists and they really got 30% reduction of noise thanks to squeezing. So it's really useful there. Now, when it comes to this more practical uh, uh, applications, I think that atomic interferometry, which is being used as a gravity, gravity sensors are probably the most likely to provide us some nice, Gra gravitometer devices that may benefit from this quantum enhancement. This, this, this is I, from, from what I understand, what, from what people are doing, is the closest, I think, to, to some real life applications. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. I think this is it for the questions. And uh, thank you for everybody who stuck around for an extra 10 minutes. Sorry uh, for the delay, but yeah, I I, I no no it, it's it's always interesting to have uh, more questions flooding in. So thank you for staying on for for the extra ten okay. minutes as well. Uh, you gave us a a free little advert for next week's speaker, and so yeah. indeed uh, everyone who's still on, please come uh, next week for Andreas Winter's talk. By the uh, way, can you send me the link as well? Uh, yeah, definitely. Section? We'll we'll send you. Yeah. And uh, you can also sign up to our newsletter and get uh, reminders yes, on the I upcoming will. talks because we, we have this. Uh, so, yeah, we'll forward uh, both the, the link and the, the subscription to the newsletter for, for future talks. Great. Um, Great. Thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.